Hi, my name is Craig, and I'm a research scientist slash software engineer on Google's quantum computing team. Today, I'll be talking to you about the history of the Honeycomb code, which is a relatively new error corrected code with the potential to open up the design space of large scale quantum computers. The Honeycomb code is relatively recent, but it's rooted in a physical model that Kataev came up with over a decade and a half ago. This model is based on a hexagonal lattice with periodic boundary conditions where the left wraps around to the right and the top wraps around to the bottom, like in Pac-Man. In this picture on the right, each of the black dots is a qubit, and each of the colored lines is an edge representing an interaction between the qubits. Each edge has a type indicated here by its color. Red edges are XX interactions, green is YY, and blue is ZZ. Although honestly, you can shuffle all the colors around and the types, and this thing still works. So don't worry too much about remembering which is which. Anyways, you get this pattern of edge colorings by three coloring the faces and then coloring each edge based on the faces it connects. When you assign the edge colors in that way, you get a lot of nice structural properties. Like for example, every qubit has one edge of each color. The natural thing to try to turn the honeycomb model into a code is to replace each of the interactions with a parity measurement. So each of these edges would now represent a two body measurement to perform. For example, this blue edge says we're supposed to measure the ZZ operator between these two qubits. These parities don't all commute. For example, this XX measurement anti-commutes with this YY measurement and with this ZZ measurement. Because the measurements aren't all compatible, what we have here is what's known as a subsystem code. And if you analyze the degrees of freedom of the subsystem code, you appear to find something disappointing. It looks like it can't store quantum information. I won't go too deep into the details, but what it comes down to is that in order for information to be protected, it has to be stored in a global way, not a local way. And all this, this layout has global cycles, like this vertical cycle of edges. That cycle is made out of edges. It's made out of things we're measuring. So if we try to use this cycle to store quantum information, we would run into a problem. Storing quantum information requires not measuring it, and it looks like we're measuring enough things to learn the global cycles. So you can't store quantum information in the system. Except that's actually not right. That's what people thought for 15 years, but it's wrong. Although this vertical cycle is a product of things we're measuring, when you consider the time dynamics, when you consider the order that things are measured in, you find that actually, even though you're measuring all these edges, you're doing it in a specific order, and that specific order never reveals the full cycle. Basically, to get the full product, you need to accumulate information over several steps but the information from each step keeps being destroyed by the next one because of the details of how the edges are incompatible with each other. So there are potentially logical qubits in the system. Someone just had to realize this and go looking for them. The someone who realized that and went looking and found the logical qubits were Hastings and Ha. They did this almost exactly one year ago now. What's particularly interesting about the observables that they found is that they don't sit still. In this picture to the right, you can see that before and after the layer of ZZ measurements, so before and after, the vertical observable is supported by different data qubits. For example, this top middle qubit is used here before, but not here after. This is unavoidable in the system. We have to keep moving the observables because otherwise they'll be destroyed by the next layer of measurements. This is part of why people didn't realize there were logical qubits in the system for such a long time. It's unusual for observables to have to move like this, or at least it's historically unusual. Maybe that will change now that we know what to look for. This is where I entered the story. I had been working on a piece of software called STIM which is a tool for analyzing and simulating stabilizer circuits, especially error correction circuits. And I've been looking for a good way to demo STIM being useful for benchmarking error correcting codes. 
So this paper by Hastings and Ha, talking about a code so counterintuitive that people missed it for 15 years, with observables was so strange that their nature is worthy of mention in the title of the paper, seemed perfect. Because STIM was actually designed with the ability to move observables. It could understand this code. Now, originally, that feature was intended for big movements, where you move a logical qubit all the way from one side of a computer to the other side. But those big movements were built out of microscopic local changes, which is what the Honeycomb code uses. So the weekend after Hastings and Ha put their paper out, I recorded myself turning the Honeycomb code into a stim circuit and then using stim features to turn that circuit into something that could be decoded, using pi matching to decode shots from it, and just generally doing the work necessary to get a rough estimate of the threshold. This was in no way a rigorous benchmarking, but it was enough to get a rough sense of how good the code was. And the amazing thing is, it looked really good. I didn't pick the Honeycomb code because I thought it would be good. I assumed it would be bad. I just wanted something to use as a demo. But anyways, in this terrible looking plot on the right, which was the final product of that weekend of work, uh, the threshold of the code where these lines intersect is really far to the right. It looks like it's above 2%. That's really good. Keep in mind for basically 10 years, if you were planning to make a large scale quantum computer, you were planning to use the surface code and the surface code is a threshold around 1%. So these are really promising initial results. I, did, I thought this was exciting and interesting, but it really needed a proper benchmarking rather than a weekend hackathon to be sure. So an impromptu, people, an impromptu team of people formed around to work on this and do the estimate properly. Specifically, the people who worked on this with me were Mike Newman, Austin Fowler, and Michael Broughton. These plots on the right are the final result of that work. They're basically showing for a given physical error rate, that's the horizontal axis, how many physical qubits do you need to make a really good logical qubit. That's the vertical axis. So lower is better here. There are two plots because we consider two different gate sets to compile into. The plot on the left is a more traditional gate set where you use unitary operations to interact the qubits. So like C naughts and CZs. The plot on the right is for a gate set where you instead interact the qubits using direct native two body parity measurements. For example, for Majorana type qubits, this would be the natural type of interaction to use. And people have demonstrated native parity measurements in other systems like superconducting systems. So although this is a bit unusual, it's not so implausible. Basically what these plots are showing is that the Honeycomb code doesn't do so well with compiling into unitary interactions. It's worse than the surface code, but it seems to do really well when compiling into measurement based interactions. When using unitary interactions, it's noticeably more expensive than the surface code, but compiling to measurement-based interactions, the costs look much lower. Now, you're probably noticing that in this rightmost plot, there's not a surface code comparison. I'll actually cycle back to that near the end of the talk. First, I wanna discuss a big problem that we didn't know how to solve when we wrote this paper. The problem being that the Honeycomb code has these periodic boundaries which prevents you from putting it on a flat surface. You have to put it on a donut. That's rather restrictive if you're printing your qubits onto a flat surface. Fortunately, that problem was solved two months later by Han Hastings. Basically the main obstacle with putting the honeycomb code on a surface instead of on a donut is that you have to add boundaries. And the boundaries had this annoying property where as you went around the XYZ measurement cycle, they would somehow unavoidably destroy the logical observables. Like because uh, this edge here touches the observable at one place instead of wrapping around and potentially touching it at two places, at some point in the cycle, that would hurt you where you would find that you needed it to touch in two places to commute. And because it only touches in one place, it anti-commutes and it destroys the observable. The solution Han Hastings came up with is actually pretty simple in hindsight. You just don't keep doing the XYZ cycle. Instead of measuring the edges in the order XYZ, 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 
you'd instead do that for as long as you could. And as soon as you're about to run into trouble, as soon as you're about to do something that would unavoidably destroy the observables, you turn around and you go back and run the cycle in reverse. Then you go in reverse as far as you could until you're about to run into trouble, turn back around and just keep doing that, bouncing back and forth. So now the measurement order would go X, Y, Z, X, Z, Y, X, Y, Z, X, Z, Y, and repeat like that. That one change and a bunch of work carefully figuring out exactly what's going on at the boundary, but, but really that one key change allowed us to start putting this code on a flat surface instead of on donuts. So now all that had to be done was to benchmark this planar variant of honeycomb code. Probably the performance would be similar to the periodic honeycomb code, but that wasn't guaranteed for a bunch of reasons. First of all, logical errors in the periodic code are cycles. And cycles have to meet up with themselves at a specific place when wrapping around. So if these were periodic boundaries, then a chain coming in here has to leave here. It can't leave here because then it would have come in there. They have to meet up with themselves. But for non-periodic boundaries, for normal boundaries, Logical errors look like a path from anywhere on the boundary to anywhere else. So it would be valid for a chain to start here and finish there. So there are more possible error paths. Potentially, there could be shorter ones. That has to be checked. The second reason I was a bit worried initially about the planar honeycomb code is this alternating order to the what order you measure things in means that some stabilizers are checked less frequently, or at least at an inconsistent rate. Like, instead of learning the value of the blue faces every three steps, we actually learn them twice in quick succession, and then have to wait five steps to learn them again. A five-step gap, instead of a three-step gap, is nearly twice as much time for physical errors to accumulate. If that long gap is the limiting factor, then we may have just effectively doubled the physical noise as perceived by the code. Ultimately, to be sure it worked well, we knew we'd have to actually check. We didn't get around to checking this right away, but four months later, we did. Actually, a team at Microsoft was doing essentially the same work in parallel. Uh, we made sure to synchronize the release of the papers to avoid scooping each other. Uh, unfortunately, the outcome of this work is uh, not so exciting, but very reassuring. The planar variant isn't any worse. The honeycomb code remains good when it's placed on a surface. The performance isn't exactly identical, but it's basically the same. You know, these curves are all on top of each other. I don't even really have to label what they are. Now, in my mind, these two papers coming out marks the honeycomb code becoming a real thing with interesting trade-offs that hardware teams could consider as a potential option. But it does naturally raise the question of whether or not there's something better out there. The Honeycomb code is not that old, and maybe it's possible to take the ideas that generated it, like using two-body parity measurements, and generate other codes. For example, uh, circling back a bit in the talk, you might remember that we didn't do a comparison to the surface code when using measurement-based interactions. Just a couple weeks ago, I put out a paper that did this comparison. Uh, inspired by how well the honeycomb code performed using measurement-based interactions, I found a way to compile the surface code into measurement-based interactions, or really to improve the compilation. There was previous work that did this. Um, the construction that I came up with uses this sort of pentagonal layout. And it had twice the threshold of the previous work, compiling the surface code into this kind of gate set. In this plot on the right, you can see this better threshold. That's just the fact that this yellow line goes off to infinity further to the right of, compared to this blue line. But you can see that it's still not as good as the honeycomb code. It closes some of the gap, but it doesn't surpass. There are also entirely new codes being proposed or variants of the honeycomb code being proposed. So far, nothing is better, but maybe there is something better out there. It's an interesting problem to work on right now because there hasn't been much work done on it yet. It's kind of wide open. Here's a table summarizing the various attributes of the Honeycomb code and the surface code when compiling into unitary interactions and measurement-based interactions. 
basically all you're supposed to take away from this table is a message I've been repeating throughout the talk that currently the honeycomb code is best when using measurement based interactions, whereas the surface code is best when using unitary interactions. Zooming out a bit, I think the really cool thing about the honeycomb code is that in the past, people have done experiments where they implement a native two body parity measurement. But generally, these experiments were seen as precursors to attempts to measure larger parities, like the four body parity operations that define the surface code. The rise of the honeycomb code makes those two body parity measurements directly useful instead of merely stepping stones to something useful. So if you're an experimentalist, implementing a good two body parity measurement is now a more compelling project to work on compared to the situation a year ago. Because now we know that having a great two body parity measurement can lead directly to fault tolerance via the honeycomb code. And that is how, like I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, the honeycomb code is expanding the available design space for large scale fault tolerant quantum computers. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.